B-29 reached 20,000 feet, it would drop Jaeger in the X-1 to try again. But two days earlier, Jaeger had fallen from a horse and broken two ribs. They hurt, and would hurt worse in the turbulence approaching Mach 1. Jaeger told no one, afraid he would be grounded. And he wanted to be in the X-1. We were up about nine, six Mach number, and uh, our Mach meter only went to 1.0. I don't think they had a lot of confidence in us those days. We were in quite a bit of buffeting, and the airplane just shook. And then, all at once, the Mach meter just jumped from off the scale. And at this point, all the buffeting quit, and the airplane just smoothed out just as slick as a glass. And then I just went ahead and shut the three chambers off and let the airplane decelerate back into the buffeting. I called in within... 15 minutes, 30 minutes of the flight. Once we knew, had seen enough to know that we had, had done it. And about two hours later, I got a call from the deputy director of NACA telling me that the program was now classified top secret. Jaeger had taken the X-1 to 43,000 feet and 700 miles an hour just past Mach 1, the speed of sound. It was, by any standard, an heroic achievement. But this was the only parade Jaeger got, pulled around on a desert runway by a dusty jeep. There was no ticker tape parade, no visit to the White House, no headlines, no public adoration. Like Lindbergh, Jaeger had helped to change the world. But Lindbergh's accomplishment was public. Jaeger's was classified. Those were the days of the Cold War, and this tentative step towards space had to be kept top secret. It was only one step. We would need so many more. The Rocket Pilots will continue in a moment. above the Mojave Desert, the Edwards test pilots pushed themselves and their new planes to the edge. If it happened in aviation in the early 50s, it happened at Edwards. That attracted 29-year-old Scott Crossfield, a civilian graduate engineer with a master's degree in aeronautics. Within a year, he would build a reputation as one of the best, a rival to Chuck Yeager. Crossfield did not fit the Hollywood image of a test pilot, but he was cocky, he was independent, and he wanted to be part of the rocket plane program. In 1980, 60 years old, Crossfield went back to Edwards. South Base is deserted now. When Crossfield first got there, it was the center of the test pilot's universe. This was really the place to be. There was no question about it at all. I was awestruck. When Walt Williams showed me the airplanes they had, there was no question in my mind where I belong. <laughs> Howard Hughes can't buy those airplanes, you know. Despite the popular imagination, test pilots were not wild and reckless. They were methodical, careful, intent on testing planes step by step. The object was to find out what the new jets and rockets could do and stay alive to report it. A lot of them didn't. killed 
17 people on this base in two years, you just learn to hypnotize yourself into putting it out of your mind. If you're given to reacting to fear, you've got no business being a test pilot. And if you refuse to acknowledge, at least to yourself, fear, you've got no business being a test pilot. The word fear, uh, you, you really don't consider it as a part of your vocabulary when you're testing airplanes, because we call it apprehension. Uh, number one, when you're involved in programs where the outcome is questionable and where your neck's on the line, it really, you don't look at it as being dangerous. It's something that you're sort of dedicated to and you're, you just sort of concede the fact that that's your job and that's what you're going to do. And, and uh, you don't really think about the outcome. And, and of course, a lot of pilots got killed. saw this kind of high-performance flying only at air shows. For the test pilots at Edwards, it was daily routine. Dangerous, but routine. The goal was research. Find out what each plane could do, what its limits were, and put it into a bland engineering report. On the other hand, no one said setting a record was all bad. Going higher, going faster, doing something today that no one could do yesterday, that's the way the test pilots kept score. In three years, Crossfield put in more hours in the experimental rocket planes than any other pilot. And if he was the calm professional in the air, he was not above showing off on the ground. Modest people are seldom, if ever, test pilots. But they are cautious, and if showing off was called for, the ground was the place to do it. It's safe there, or it's supposed to be. I had made many dead stick landings with the rocket airplanes on the lake bed, and had perfected a technique where I could land where I wanted, and then I would coast up the ramp and tap the brakes and park the airplane in front of the hangar, dead stick and that was just a little flourish. Scott's a pretty good pilot, but he, like all of us test pilots who were flying so many different kinds of airplanes in those days, didn't pay an awful lot of attention to the emergency systems. And what happened, he landed on a lake bed and brought the airplane up onto the ramp and was going to stop it in front of the hangar, but had no brakes, so it went right on through the hangar and the nose stuck right through the wall. And subsequently, every time he had a chance in public, Jaeger would always say the sonic wall was his, the hangar wall was Crossfield's. There was a rivalry between Crossfield and Jaeger. It was most obvious in November 1953, one month short of the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight. The Air Force wanted to use the X-1A to celebrate. Jaeger had taken the X-1 past the speed of sound, and the Air Force wanted him to take the X-1A to twice the speed of sound. The plane was designed to fly that fast, and Jaeger decided to try. Crossfield wanted to get there first. He talked the Navy into letting him try for Mach 2 in the Douglas Skyrocket. It was not designed for that speed. But whoever reached Mach 2 would be the fastest man alive, if he survived. Crossfield tried first. He and his crew did everything they could think of to make the aging Skyrocket faster than it ought to be. We cold soaked that thing and wiped off every fly speck. There wasn't any excess drag on it at all. And we started loading it oh six or eight hours earlier than we would and let that liquid oxygen just soak it till it was so damn cold you couldn't touch it your hand would freeze on it anywhere and it was a good cold morning miserable morning i had the flu the weather was bad Crossfield tried and failed six times. In late November 1953, 
he made his seventh and final attempt to reach Mach 2. He either did it this time or let Jaeger try. Being second was not crossfield style. He would use all his skill and knowledge to take the skyrocket to twice the speed of sound, even if it wasn't supposed to fly that fast. Crossfield fired all four rockets and started to climb. He easily passed Mach 1 and kept going. At 72,000 feet, Crossfield put the rocket plane into a dive and hit Mach 2. It was there, you know. <laughs> it was a good, something you wanted to do. I'd be first to do. Particularly if I could meet a Jaeger of mine. That would be like... <laughs> At Edwards Air Force Base, Muroc, California, test pilot Scott Crossfield and the needle-nosed Douglas Skyrocket. Now, 32-year-old scientist pilot Scott Crossfield, first man to fly twice the speed of sound. 22 days later, Chuck Yeager got his shot at the title, Fastest Man Alive. Crossfield had gone 1,291 miles per hour, Mach 2.005. Jaeger wanted to go faster. He did, Mach 2.42. It almost killed him. As we went through 2.3 Mach number, the airplane began to yaw. Then the outside wings started coming up, and nothing was causing the airplane to respond. And the airplane rolled over, went inverted, and then pitched up. At this point, the canopy button. And I didn't know, really, I, I couldn't orient myself to up and down. And the X-1A, we had no way of getting out of it either. No ejection seat, so, of course, I blacked out. With Jaeger blacked out, the X-1A fell 51,000 feet in 51 seconds. The plane spun and tumbled. Jaeger was simultaneously pushed, pulled, and slammed around. His helmet cracked the canopy. He came to disoriented, weak, and bleeding. The X-1A was in a deadly end-over-end -end tumble and inverted spin. It is usually fatal. So I just sort of hung on in this inverted spin. I recovered from that into normal spin and popped it out of the normal spin at about 25,000 feet and looked around, found the lake bed, and glided on in and landed. Jaeger had beaten the sound barrier only to find a second barrier. Engineers called it high-speed instability, a loss of all control at 1,500 miles per hour. Jaeger regained control. Crossfield knew why. It's uh, Jaeger's total skill that, that, that allowed him to recover the airplane so that we had one to go another day. It was probably fortunate that Jaeger was a pilot on that flight. Jaeger is now retired, but still flies supersonic jets. In 1954, one year after he survived high-speed instability, he returned to regular Air Force flight duty. In 1962, he went back to Edwards to help train astronauts. In those eight years, Jaeger missed a revolution at Edwards. Scientists and technicians had stopped wondering about the sky and started wondering about space. If a hotshot like Jaeger could tear up the sky, why couldn't someone with a better, faster, more stable craft tear up space? No one could think of a reason why man could not fly into space. Jaeger was away when the X-2 finally arrived at Edwards five years behind schedule. It had been built to fly three times the speed of sound, Mach 3, and theoretically it could. Theoretically. The 
26. Air Force Captain Milburn Apt tries for a record in the X-2. He wants the rocket plane to do what it was designed to do, fly at three times the speed of sound. Captain Apt died, a victim of that neutral engineering phrase, high speed and stability. From the pieces of the X-2, engineers learned that the tail had to be larger. And until it was, no one was going to survive Mach 3. There was a rocket plane that might make it, that might get past not only high speed and stability, but the Earth's atmosphere as well. A plane that might fly into space. But it wasn't ready, so everyone waited for the X-15. The planning had started years before. The X-15 was not another rocket-powered aircraft. It was to be the first rocket-powered spacecraft. The Wright brothers took us into the air. The X-15 was to take us beyond it. Using a million horsepower rocket engine, the X-15 was designed to break away from Earth's gravity and fly into space. It would not orbit. It would go into space and back in controlled flight. The X-15 was being built by North American Aviation, and one of the men working on it was Scott Crossfield. He had left Edwards and joined the private contractor. He wanted to help with the design, fly the builder's tests, and persuade the government to let him take it into space. Crossfield was betting his career that he could do it. Crossfield's boss at North American was the X-15 project coordinator, an engineer named Harrison Storms. Storms knew exactly what he wanted the X-15 to be. It was the most advanced aircraft in the world. In fact, it still is the most advanced aircraft in the world as far as that goes, even today. Storms wasn't building the X-15 so that Crossfield or anyone else could fly fast in the clear Mojave sky. He was looking beyond the sky. One of the most powerful reasons for wanting to do a project like the X-15 is it's one of the primary steps on your way to space. And it's a necessary step. But there was another way to space. Scientists were working with ballistic missiles. You couldn't fly them, and in the 50s, as often as not, you couldn't launch them either. At Cape Canaveral, missiles were an exotic, expensive, often explosive scientific sideshow. didn't matter until the fall of 1957. The Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1. It orbited the Earth, its steady beep, a constant reminder that we had been beaten. It was just at dusk, and I looked up, and there was Sputnik. To see that moving across the sky, which was just a point of light, was really an awesome feeling. There was something that I couldn't touch, I couldn't get to, I couldn't uh, do anything about it. I felt a degree of frustration, resentment. Chagrin, shock, downright embarrassing. We, we didn't like it worth a damn, professionally. Six, five, four. 63 days after the first beep from Sputnik, the United States had a Vanguard missile ready to launch from Cape Canaveral. It would put us back into the space race. There was live national television coverage. At North American, the X-15 program had its own problems. The rocket plane was on schedule, the rocket engine was not. It became very obvious that we were not going to have the LR-99 engine, the big engine, 
ready when the airplane was going to be ready. And uh, one, we had underfunded it. We had underestimated the job of changing this Viking engine from a missile. We wanted it to be throttleable. A throttleable rocket engine had never been built up to that point. So these were very extreme requirements. And we simply weren't getting there. One of the earlier decisions of the newly formed Space Administration was that ballistic missiles, not winged craft, would be the fastest, least expensive way to put men into space. Attention shifted from Edwards to Canaveral. The test pilots at Edwards said that no one would fly these things, they'd ride them. There would be no pilots, only passengers. October 1958, a year after Sputnik, North American rolled out the first X-15. It did not have the million horsepower engine. Instead, it used two X-1 engines. It wasn't what anyone wanted. It was the best anyone could do. Vice President Richard Nixon proclaimed it the day that America regained the lead in space. The X-15 had never been in the air. In theory, it would work, but in theory, so did the X-2. And that plane had killed three men. Scott Crossfield would fly the tests for North American, but the government had talented, eager test pilots ready to take over the controls, and they were young. Jaeger was gone. As the X-15 was taken by truck to Edwards, Crossfield was the old pro. He was 38, and he knew the X-15. Perhaps his ambition and the national interest might come together with the controls of an experimental rocket plane just over 50 feet long and 22 feet across. The United States desperately needed a success in space, something to polish a thoroughly tarnished image. Crossfield desperately wanted to try. We fully understood that we were now under the gun to do something for our country and to really get back our own internal self-confidence and know how good we really were. Never has been any question in my mind that anybody could beat us at this business of high technology, like in aviation or in space. Rocket Pilots will continue in a moment. To the Rocket Pilots. One bearing is 380 degrees. Number two bearing is 295 degrees. One minute till drop. Uh oh. Scott, upper bearing on the number two, please. One two upper bearing has come up to 295 degrees. Roger at uh, a little over 300. Shut her down. Okay, Scott says no drop. Scott, he wants to go home. Raj, I take it as no drop. Is the launch light on? Negative, I'm not going to drop it. Right. Before flight tests could begin, scientists had to know if the X-15 would glide, as it must to land, or drop like a rock. The only way to find out was for a B-52 to carry Scott Crossfield's X-15 aloft and launch it. It sounded so simple. For months, the X-15 was carried aloft and carried back, still nestled under the starboard wing. It had not been launched, not once. Reporters and photographers assigned to cover the X-15 story wrote of frustration and failure. The pressure to succeed increased. We were on camera at that time, and there was just no question that we were expected to carry the banner. We were very vulnerable to, uh, let's say, tarnishing the national image, and we're just determined we weren't going to make any critical mistakes. 
With the recent success of Space Shuttle, it is difficult to remember how desperate the United States was in 1959 for any accomplishment in space. The people who worked on X-15 still remember the crushing psychological pressure to give the country something to boost morale. Technicians would work like dogs, only to have a launch canceled. They were getting spooked. Crossfield and storms were getting uneasy. The whole crew can get a disease called cancellitis. As soon as they come into any difficulty, if you give up, everybody will give up. It was a tough, difficult airplane to get going. We handled some very atrocious chemicals. It was cold and miserable working out there all night to get it ready. And in the morning to get the flight going, I very often got in the cockpit, even though it wasn't time, just to let those guys know that uh, we were gonna go today. And as long as I sat in the cockpit, I sat there for eight hours one time, and I remember, well into the afternoon. As long as I sat in that cockpit, they would work their hearts out to get those systems working, not to let me down. Okay, here we go. June 8, 1959. So far, the sleek black X-15 has been nothing more than extremely expensive wing cargo. No one knows if it can reach space, or fly, or even glide. In order to glide to a landing, Crossfield had to jettison the lower or ventral fin. Don't forget your ventral. Okay, we might clear the edge of the lake here. Right. Show coming off now. Clean separation. Good deal, buddy. Right. John 260. Right. Oh, she handles nice right along here. It had gone so well. Then it began to go wrong. Crossfield had to depend on instruments and the chase pilot's instructions to land. But on this first landing, the power control system proved too sensitive. Anything Crossfield did was too much. The closer he got to ground, the worse it looked. true then as it is now. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. 
Crossfield was an engineer, and he suspected that some design error had made the X-15 inherently dangerous. They couldn't believe the airplane was unstable, and yet... ...instability. In my mind, there was no question of stability. The airplane had proven stable, it tested stable. I knew it was stable. It was also a first flight. It took a little bit of doing, getting used to. Crossfield was wrong. Storms was right. The problem was a minor adjustment. To the public, it didn't matter. The spotlight was on Cape Canaveral. NASA named the seven men chosen to be the first astronauts, those who would ride Mercury capsules into space, then into orbit. But they're not by spacecraft, but by missiles. No one had yet been into space, but the astronauts became instant celebrities. The test pilots at Edwards were forgotten. I never envied the astronauts. They had a very difficult row to hold. They were men of some consequence, and they knew how this idolatry was. But I kind of felt I was the first astronaut, or at least was way ahead of them. The rocket pilots will continue in a moment. Would simply disappear. Crossfield had made the B-52 pilot agree that if there is trouble, the pilot will dump the X-15 and save the B-52. That is not heroics, but mathematics. Better to lose one man than five. For this test, Joe Walker of NASA would fly one of the chase planes and Air Force Major Bob White the other. Both were waiting to take the X-15 into space when North American turned it over to the government. Crossfield wanted to fly the X-15 to space, but the government didn't want him there. His orders were specific, low and slow, below 60,000 feet, below Mach 2. Crossfield could obey his orders only if there was a launch, if the rocket engines fired, if they did not blow up, if the X-15 flew, if no one made a mistake, if the engineers were right, if. 20 seconds. Looks right is on. Got it on, 15 seconds. That's a prime look. Looks good, it's blossom. 10 seconds. Hi, calm down, Scott. Four, three, two, one, three. It worked. The X-15's first powered flight was perfect, and to stay low and slow, Crossfield had to hold it back. The X-15 went nowhere near its limits. To celebrate, Crossfield allowed himself one unauthorized barrel roll. Nothing went wrong. The first powered flight was perfect. So was the second. The third started as well, then went wrong. One of the engines caught fire. I got a fire start, my shutdown. Crossfield and his chase pilots were calm. No one mentioned the obvious. The X-15 could explode. How much fire have I got? Back by uh, the rear of the engine. Well, I'm off. Do I need jettison? Am I jettisoning? Are you jettisoning? Roger. Six 
Coming in nose down, Crossfield could not jettison the fuel. He was heavy, too heavy. Okay, you can, uh, don't forget to arm your ventral. Ventral coming off now. It's off, and the ventral is off. Uh, jettison the flaps. The X-15 touched down. And broke. What's happening? Bill, this QC, do you read Scott at all? The X-15 split inches behind the cockpit, inches ahead of the fuel tanks. Move the split either way, and Crossfield might not have walked away. There was a design oversight in the nose gear, and that's what caused it to break in two. In fact, it probably should have broken on the first landing that I ever made with the airplane, because the deficiency was there. That deficiency was corrected. And of the next 16 launches, 13 were successful. North American's X-15 tests ended. The governments began. Joe Walker of NASA flew the X-15, and Crossfield flew Chase in a conventional jet, their roles reversed. The X-15 was flawless. Competitive instincts came back. Be first. Be fastest. Go highest. Head for space. Maybe the X-15 could beat the Russians. Perhaps even beat the Mercury astronauts. Spring 1960. One and a half years after the X-15 was rolled out, the million horsepower engine arrives at Edwards. Someone has to test it someone who knows what he's doing. Scott Crossfield would make the engine do everything it would have to do to carry the X-15 to space. The X-15 was locked in steel grips. Crossfield wouldn't fly one foot, but he would be as alone as if he were in the air. On this, uh, sequence. Those who designed and built the engine were confident it would work. But it might explode. And a million horsepower would make a big bang. Okay, at your end of the pillboxes and close the doors, Art, will you make sure everybody is clear and then come in yourself? Right. Uh, Ed, would you give us a short blast on the siren? It is axiomatic in testing. Never risk more people than you must. To test the engine, the only man who had to be risked was Crossfield. bang I'd ever heard. It was like being in the sun, and the cockpit and instrument bay was blown about, oh, 30 or 40 feet from its original position, and the fire was burning all around. And while I, of course, was concerned, I realized that I was in a structure in the cockpit that was designed to resist heat. What Crossfield survived was a force 50 times the pull of gravity. He survived because the cockpit had been designed to protect the pilot from that force and worse. 
Crossfield had helped design it. And the engine design was good. The explosion was caused by a faulty valve. The rocket pilots will continue in a moment, Pennants. November 1960. Scott Crossfield flew a complete X-15, million horsepower engine and all. It had three times the power of a Vanguard missile and burned a ton of fuel in 11 seconds. Crossfield finally was in a spacecraft. It could climb out of the Earth's atmosphere at six times the speed of sound. It was a culmination of many years. That was the flight we'd worked for from the day we first conceived the X-15, and all of the pieces were in place. It was the World Series. But it was the World Series only if you were allowed to play. Crossfield was not. The orders remained. Stay in the sky, stay out of space. Crossfield did what he was told perfectly. North American had turned over one X-15 to the government and was ready to turn over the other two. Crossfield still hoped that he could take one of them into space. No one knew more about the rocket plane than he did, but plenty of pilots wanted to know. In addition to Walker and White, Standing in the wings were Neil Armstrong, John McKay, Forrest Peterson, and Robert Rushworth, all of them eager and able. Crossfield made one last try. Scotty introduced the proposal that he be uh, allowed to fly the majority of the flights for the government. It, uh, it would not have been good for all of us if one pilot had done all of the flying. I realize he did that because he really wanted to stay with the program. We all had the desire to fly, and I felt at the time Scotty'd had enough. He made his choice. He could have stayed at NASA and been assured a chance of doing the high-speed flights, but instead he elected to go to the contractor. I think uh, he was just hoping that the contractor would get the whole program, and it didn't. December 1960, Crossfield's last flight. Whatever he was going to do with the X-15, he would have to do now or forget. Almost everyone expected something. I think there were a lot of people uh, at Edwards uh, who felt that Scott might try to cut loose. I had mixed feelings. I, I knew that if he got the chance, he certainly wanted to do it. But on the other hand, he's a very highly disciplined man. But I know he wanted to make those flights in the worst way. That's why the restrictions went down. Put it right down in black and white as to what he was supposed to do and expected him to follow it. But in any way we could ensure that, On the ground, Crossfield could be controlled. In the air, he would be on his own. the high desert, men talked about and bet money on what Crossfield would do once he was aloft. Crossfield had been flying the X-15 for 18 months. Of 30 test flights, this was his 14th. But both Walker and White had gone faster, 
past Mach 3. And White had gone higher, above 130,000 feet. If Crossfield wanted his name in the records, he would do it this time or not at all. All Crossfield had to do was put slight pressure on the throttle, and the X-15 would set any record he wanted. Crossfield's orders would prevent a record. If he disobeyed, what more could anyone do to him? On the ground, people looked up to see what kind of Hollywood finish Crossfield would put on his flights of the X-15. On his last flight, Crossfield did what he had done on all the others. He obeyed orders. There's a lot of people that think of a test pilot in terms of a guy that goes out and lays his life on the line and goes for broke with the scarf flying and all that. The people who were making bets that I would open the X-15 up, but they didn't know me. There just was no way that could happen. I got just about all out of it any man could get out of a single program. You can't ask for it all, you know. I got all, all eight yards. Didn't get to nine yards, that's all. The ninth yard would have been to fly the X-15 into space. Crossfield did not. Other men would. Crossfield's work, his flights, had made that possible. The Rocket Pilots will continue in a moment. At Pilots. Colonel William Knight was one of the pilots who followed Crossfield. Now vice commander of the Edwards Test Center, he established a speed record in the X-15 that stood for 13 years. But the goal was space research. It was a hybrid airplane. It was rocket powered. It was capable of flying outside of the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, and going faster than anything we had ever flown before. We were looking at what it would do to the pilot, what it would do to the airplane. All of those things were unknowns. In 1961, NASA and military pilots started towards space in careful, calculated, controlled steps. Fourteen years earlier, Chuck Yeager had first flown at the speed of sound. Now, that was slow. Only one flight in 1961 was below Mach 2. Faster and faster towards space. By the end of the year, Major Bob White would take the X-15 above 200,000 feet and would go faster than 4,000 miles per hour, above Mach 6. Those successes were overshadowed before they were achieved. 
Soviet Union not only went into space, his capsule made a single orbit around the Earth, putting the United States behind again. The X-15 could not match Gagarin's achievement, nor could the ballistic missiles. A month later, Mercury astronaut Alan Shepard made a suborbital flight. A missile shot him 116 miles up, 302 miles downrange. It won a commitment from the president. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. stole the show. The public imagination was captured by the thundering, fiery precision of them. Broadcast live. It was the show of the decade. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. Success on success. July 17th, 1962. Major White flies the X-15 into space and flies back. Only a few people notice. In the next five years, seven X-15 pilots will routinely fly into space, do research for the Gemini and Apollo programs, and fly back. The X-15 was the space program's workhorse. The ballistic missile was the thoroughbred racing for the moon. October 1967. Pete Knight is given a new research project. The job will make him the fastest man alive or kill him. Knight is to test the effect of high-speed aerodynamic heating. The X-15 is fitted with extra fuel tanks and sprayed with a heat-resistant coating. Knight's job is to push the X-15 to 4,000 miles per hour. Scientists know the airstream will create enormous heat. They don't know precisely what that heat will do. Knight reached more than 4,500 miles per hour. And as we did that, we burned off the lower ventrile, uh, we burnt the ramjet off. Uh, the temperatures were getting so high and we were burning things out uh, faster than I could have probably taken care of. And if I had known it was the last flight, uh, rather than stopping at 6.7, I think I would have been tempted to go to Mach 7 at least, just to get one more Mach number. But I think if we had, uh, we would have probably lost the aircraft. The protective coating failed, but during the test, Knight reached 4,520 miles per hour, a record. Knight's record would stand until the space shuttle. In the 1981 World Almanac and Book of Facts, Knight's name is not mentioned, not at all. Six weeks later, November 15, 1967, an X-15 pilot was killed, the only one in nine years. Major Michael Adams died trying to come back from space. His ground control officer on that day was Pete Knight. Because of the malfunction, one of the displays was giving him erroneous information. And so as it turned out, as he went over the top, he got the airplane turned around 100 degrees. So he actually re-entered the atmosphere backwards. The airplane then went into a classical spin actually broke itself up as it re-entered the atmosphere. And he was never in a position to eject or get out of the airplane uh, safely. The rocket pilots will continue in a moment. October 
Gilbert, 1968. The X-15 program ends. There had been 199 flights to find answers the space program needed. Twelve men flew the X-15. Scott Crossfield was first. William Dano was last. Pete Knight went more than 4,500 miles an hour. Joe Walker went more than 67 miles high. Michael Adams died. And there it ended. No more would the X-15 blaze across the desert sky. But the information from the program was being used to develop something new. From the time of Greek mythology, Men have dreamed of flying, of commanding the sky. Only recently have they dreamed of commanding space, of flying there. And they have. 34 years after Slick Goodland landed the X-1 on the dry lake bed at Edwards, the space shuttle landed there. The X-1 led to the X-15. The X-15 to the shuttle. And the shuttle could make space as useful as the Wright brothers had made the sky useful. If so, the way was paved by the X-15 and the 12 men who flew it. Robert Crippen and John Young, who flew the shuttle, knew that. The experience that we gained from an aerodynamic standpoint, energy standpoint, and basic early rocket technology was the kind of thing that made the space shuttle possible. And the lift to drag ratio of the space shuttle is almost identical to that of the X-15. Very similar programs with a good deal of uh, feedback into the space shuttle, and uh, it really paid off. Crippen and Young became our newest heroes. We showered them with ticker tape and adoration. Charles Lindbergh, who flew the Atlantic, got much more. Chuck Yeager, who broke the sound barrier, much less. I think people need heroes. Sometimes they're hard to come by. I think that because John and I had an opportunity to do something unique, and people were looking for something they could grab hold of and, and have a positive kind of effect on them, that uh, at least for a short period of time, we were put in the hero world. That's the way this uh, world is now. We're in the future right now. Everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes, and we're on minute about 14, and that's the way things are. That's the way it's handled uh, in the media and everywhere, and that's the way it's going to be from now on. And uh, that's all right. That's fine. So much has happened in our lifetime. We forget too easily and too quickly. It was only 78 years ago that an automobile made the first trip from coast to coast. It took 71 days. Now it takes five days round trip to the moon. We celebrate what we have done. We forget who did it. We keep the machines. We discard the people. In today's world of high-speed change, how long would Charles Lindbergh have held our imagination? We expect success. We assume technology will make it possible. Advanced machines eclipse the men who control them. Did Chuck Yeager break the sound barrier, or did the X-1? Do we look up to the man or the machine? Before these machines led us to space, we lived in a time we could more easily understand, even share. We could imagine being in the sky with Lindbergh. We might even have been able to do what he did. Maybe. No more. Perhaps what has happened in our lifetime will be seen more clearly in the future. Machines took us into space. They would not have had not man conceived them, designed them, built them, and flown them. Most importantly, no machine would have been in space 
had not some person dreamed of going there. Machines do. Men dream. From those dreams, we build the American adventure. Next week on Living Dangerously, a group of climbers brave freezing 100 mile per hour winds back from space, especially for a pilot. And so we felt that if we could develop an aircraft that back from space, much better way to come back in our opinion. So we decided to build a small demonstrator without asking for headquarters approval because we were a little afraid that because of the politics they would say no. The flyers at Edwards tried out a shape that would fly without wings called a lifting body. They pulled it behind a car. It was pretty bizarre uh, flying a very advanced spacecraft behind a Pontiac out in the middle of the desert, you know, thinking that this might lead to a new spacecraft. The official research program later took up the flyer's idea. What it wanted was a reusable spacecraft, one that could fly back to Earth when its space journey was done. Those who tested it ran great risks. The edge of the unknown is a dangerous place. always the winged airplanes, the lifting airplanes, that I could relate to. So even though I admired the people that flew the, uh, the Mercury and the Gemini and the Apollo, I, it was nothing, I, it was something that I didn't want to be a part of. And uh, I was glad when the, uh, when the shuttle came along and put wings back on the spacecraft. April 12, 1981. Within a lifetime, the proving ground of Kitty Hawk has become the proving ground of space. Pilots John Young and Bob Crippen put their lives on the line to show that man can go into space and fly back to Earth. There's Crip waiting to go fly. He doesn't look very nervous, but you can see I have a nervous smile there. I think I was as nervous as Crip was, but I'm just so old that my, my heart wouldn't go any faster. Anybody who's not apprehensive about climbing on top of a first-time flight of a liquid hydrogen oxygen uh, rocket ship really doesn't understand the problem. And I think both Grip and I were fairly nervous. Only 78 years after the Wright brothers launched their first fragile airplane, Young and Crippen are bringing an airplane back from space. This is re-entry. We're probably moving at Mach 18.6, and you could feel the vehicle turning right up over the water. Really tremendous. There was a Mach 10 roll reversal. This is a 
roll back at uh, Mach 4.8 over Bakersfield, California. And the vehicle was behaving uh, very solidly. It's a beautiful handling machine. Looking very smooth, speed brake. We're coming down at 20 degrees gamma, which is about six times uh, steeper than the average airliner makes an approach. You maintain your airspeed out there at about 285 knots, equivalent airspeed. I have to say it was one of my best landings because I uh, made a whole bunch of landings in T-38s right after the flight. None of them were as good as that one. The flight was a success. But they needed the resources and the manpower of the richest economy in the world. Testing the unknown, reaching beyond the skies, has become the most expensive business on Earth. There are still new challenges, of course. Steps to take as daring as those first taken by the Wright brothers. A spacecraft that can take off from a runway, for example. NASA is already designing one called the National Aerospace Plane. Britain has another, Hotel. In the end, only the energies and wealth of countries and corporations will get them off the ground. But there is still a place for individuals, for the lone inventors who, in their garages and dreams, first launched the romance of modern aviation. This is a revolutionary new plane, built of new materials, conceived by a solo visionary, the Starship. touched by the same vision as the Wright brothers, Bert Rutan. I had a model airplane background, and I found that, yes, indeed, it is possible to build your airplane in your garage and go out and fly it. And I somewhat stumbled on this method of moldless composite construction, not really knowing whether they would be acceptable ways to produce airplanes was able to produce an airplane in three months. That was the big breakthrough. From then on, I realized, my gosh, if I can build an airplane in three or four months, no reason why I can't, over a couple of years, uh, develop and test four or five or six configurations. most significant thing was not just the stall-limiting canard aerodynamics. I think the reason that I've been called a pioneer is that in 20 years I've developed, flight-tested, flown over 20 different types of airplanes, using the composites primarily as a shortcut so that I can build a wing this week instead of taking months to tool it and weeks to build it. Rutan created Voyager, that most remarkable of aircraft, designed to circle the world without landing or refueling. Like the early pioneers, he brought the edges of the unknown and the impossible a little closer. I didn't invent a new technology or a new material for Voyager. I stuck my neck out and applied it without asking myself, gee, isn't that too dangerous? Or won't that maybe not work? Well, of course, it's dangerous as hell to make an airplane that if we'd have had the little bit of turbulence out of takeoff, we'd have lost the airplane crew. And uh, if I'd have added 2 or 3% more weight to it, it'd have gone off the end of the runway in flames.
I think the world of aviation will uh, gain from me mostly inspiration. The fact that a few people, literally in a garage or a small shop, built an airplane that doubled an absolute distance record, flew all the way around the world, flew through all this weather and came back home safely. The fact that that was done all composite, without mixing metals, without solving all these stupid problems that the engineers make for themselves, that will provide the inspiration that, my God, it, it can be done. We're going to do it. We'll stick our necks out. I knew how the Wright brothers felt when they came upon these things and, and had success. TNT's exclusive... This alarm clock telephone can be yours free in just TNT's exclusive premiere of Reaching for the Skies. The Skies continues with a look at Aviation First's Trailblazers. May the 20th, 1927. A young American flyer sets out on a journey that will shrink the world. Where? Contact. Contact. In his aircraft, Spirit of St. Louis, Charles Lindbergh will be the first man to fly the Atlantic solo and become one of aviation's greatest trailblazers. Nose wheel well up, smooth rotation continuing. Nose come up to 20 degrees, she's airborne. She flies. April 1969, another trailblazing flight. This time it's the world's first supersonic airliner, the Anglo-French Concorde. Lindbergh had taken 33 and a half hours to cross the Atlantic. Concorde would soon be offering a regular service that took less than three. The ultimate Earth Shrinker. Aviation has shrunk the world to livable size and uh, it's made one community of the world. It's changed our whole manner of thinking and living on this little globe. I think in my wildest dreams, I never anticipated how far and how fast we would go. Exactly 50 years separated Concorde's maiden flight and the very first direct crossing of the Atlantic in a converted Vickers Dimmy bomber. 1919 was the year that aviation trailblazing took off. With the First World War over, there were tens of thousands of planes looking for something to do. For the first time, countries could be linked and oceans crossed. The skies of the world cried out to be conquered. Indeed, the challenge had been thrown down six years earlier by the Daily Mail of London. A 10,000-pound prize for the first non-stop crossing of the Atlantic. In June 1919, two Royal Air Force pilots, John Alcock and Arthur Whitton Brown, arrived in Newfoundland to attempt the 2,000-mile flight to Ireland. Their Vickers Vimy had arrived in crates from England and was assembled on site. Meanwhile, another attempt was underway. Three Curtis flying boats of the U.S. Navy set out from Newfoundland to cross the Atlantic in stages. First stop was the Azores to refuel. Two aircraft failed to get there, though their crews were saved. The third, flown by Lieutenant Commander Reed with a crew of five, made it and went on via Lisbon to reach Plymouth. Their journey, the first flight of any kind across the Atlantic, had taken 15 days. Back in North America, no less than 12 different aircraft were trying for the 10,000-pound prize. By June 14th, the Vimy of Alcock and Brown was ready for takeoff from the grass strip of St. John's. Groaning with 870 gallons of fuel needed for the flight, the Vimy slowly took off and headed east at a height of 1,200 feet. Overnight, the two pilots battled with fog banks, storms, ice, and dense cloud, while the world waited for news. After 16 hours, they finally reached the coast of Ireland and landed in a bog. An unceremonious end to a great adventure. But both men became instant heroes, claimed their prize, and were knighted. 
The first non-stop crossing of the Atlantic in 1919 was just one of the many trailblazing achievements of that remarkable year. In November, two Australian brothers, Ross and Keith Smith, returning from Europe after the war, took up another challenge. The Australian government had offered 10,000 pounds for the first flight from London to Australia in under 30 days. After an event to spare. Behind such flights was the prospect of commercial aviation. It would be many years before such long distances could be flown by fare-paying passengers. But over shorter distances, commercial flights were already underway. The first international service began between...